In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who have taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, this is now the second part of this particular section of catechesis for those who are preparing to enter the Third Order. As I said in the previous video, when my hair was a little longer, I think, um, this is kind of a large topic, split up into four parts. And so the first part was about the nature and the ends or the objectives of the Third Order. And then the following three parts will be on, which is going to be in this video, <clears throat> is about the obligations for those who are in the Third Order, the benefits of those who are in the Third Order, and then something very brief on the government and structure of the Third Order itself. So now when we go on to, as we said, the obligations, um, we already kind of saw somewhat um, a little bit, not necessarily the obligations, but when we talked about the objectives or the ends of the Third Order, we talked about the universal end, which is to give glory to God and to sanctify my soul and others' souls. And then there's a specific end for those in our religious family, which is the enculturation of the gospel or to evangelize the culture. But now when we look at these um, concrete obligations for those who are part of the third order, it's like taking what we talked about before, the nature and the objectives and bringing it down into really concrete things. What are we supposed to do if we're a member of the third order? So there are at the beginning of this, we'll talk about these two main, the two great obligations that really every Christian has. Um, and then also, of course, necessarily, as members of the Third Order, we will also have um, in our own particular way, let's say, but still um, something that we share with all Christians. The first of these obligations is apostolic activity, the apostolic activity of the lay faithful. So every lay person, by the fact, or every every Christian, lay or religious or consecrated or whatever, um, by the fact of being baptized and therefore incorporated into Jesus Christ, into his mystical body, has both the right, but also the duty to participate in the mission of Christ, which is to spread the gospel, to preach and proclaim the gospel throughout the world for the salvation of the world, for the salvation of other men. Um, so that's something, yes, essential to our apostolate as Christians. The church is essentially missionary. It's not, uh, it's not a cool aspect that some people do. Some people are missionaries. They go to Africa or wherever and they do that. That's not me. I don't do that. No, oh, maybe we don't go to a mission land, but we are all called to be missionaries in a way. It even comes from the Latin word, uh, mission comes from the Latin word to send. We are sent out um, by, by God into the world to proclaim according to our different circumstances, our different abilities, or our different way of life, um, to participate in that proclamation, that being sent, that missionary spirit. So all of us are called to do this uh, external, let's say, apostolate for the sake of others. Our directory says, it is the aspiration, desire, and obsession of the laity of the incarnate word to bring the light of the gospel to all men, manifesting Christ to the world from his own lay vocation, to bring and carry Christ to the most distant, most hidden places where priests cannot reach or enter, to evangelize cultures from the deepest, from the most intimate, making the Lord reign in reality, enculturating the gospel in the most remote places of human life kind of interesting, it says the places that the priests, we could also say maybe the sisters, the religious, cannot enter. Obviously, there are places that we religious, we priests or sisters, can um, enter, and it's not 
as if to say that the lady can't go there, you know, like, oh, there's a priest there, I can't involve myself. No, but what we're also saying is that uh, there are places that we, because of our consecrated way of life, um, we don't get involved in, in many aspects of society. Not because they're sinful, but just because it's not uh, proper to us, who are supposed to dedicate ourselves more um, specifically to the things of God, to be in all of those ambits of society. So if that's the case, then there may be people that we will never have contact with. And so therefore it's the task of the lady specifically in, in these other realms where maybe priests are present, but also specifically in that realm as well um, for the sake of those souls. So the idea is that the lay person carries out this mission as a lay person, not as a religious, but as a lay person specifically, which is someone inserted in society, in the temporal reality, as if the leaven of bread, as Christ says, you put leaven in the bread and, and then it grows. So we are like a living cell in society or leaven in the bread that causes it to, gives it life, makes it grow. And so this obligation of apostolic activity presupposes, necessarily presupposes, the other major obligation, just like concave and convex naturally always go together, or presuppose each other, we could say. Um, so this second necessary major obligation is to seek one's own union with God, to cultivate the interior life, as it is sometimes said. The directory here says, as a cornerstone and foundation of all apostolic action, the laity must seek intimate union with God. There must be a very close union between perfection and the apostolate. The interior life is the soul of every apostolate and the guarantee of its effectiveness. Therefore, the primary and fundamental duty of every layperson must be that each one seeks his own perfection, seeking an intimate and deep union with God. Every apostolate is founded on this truth. Obviously, it's important to remember that when we talk about perfection, when Christ says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, it doesn't mean some sort of external perfection. You know, you have to be able to do, I don't know, throw a ball well or whatever. He's talking about moral, spiritual perfection, which is possible with the grace of God to become, to become spiritually perfect and holy as the saints. So we have to seek that. We have to seek our own holiness, especially in, in prayer and the sacraments and, and different and retreats, etc. Um, because if we don't do this, if we don't work on our own sanctification, if we don't work on our own interior life, our own spiritual life, how are we going to be able to give that to somebody else? Uh, you can't give what you don't have. That's the, and it's true. There's a very nice book that I would recommend called The Soul of the Apostolate. And it really talks about this. It, so just as a body doesn't have life without a soul, so apostolate or going out and, and trying to help and evangelize others, it doesn't have life, it doesn't have effectiveness, if we don't have the soul of the apostolate, which is the cultivation of our own interior life. He focuses, I think, in that book, especially on prayer, but not just prayer, because prayer can also even be an apostolate for the sake of others, but working on our own interior spiritual perfection <clears throat> is necessary if we want to go out and change the world. So. As we said, these are the two main, the two principal, let's say, obligations. And then there are more specific obligations that we can put underneath these two. So these obligations of the third order should make us be enthusiastic. They should motivate us to you know, set us aflame with desire for souls. Um, okay, so the first of these more specific obligations is the faithful and perfect fulfillment of the duty of state meaning the duty of our state in life. The directory says, it is impossible to build any apostolic work if it is not founded on the first obligations faithfully and legitimately fulfilled. So when we talk about our state in life, that means <clears throat> my state as a priest or as a religious brother or as a father, a husband, um, a student, uh, someone who has a job, I'm a layperson and I have a job that's part of my, my state in life. I'm a, a son, I'm still a child, but I, you know, so I'm a, a son living under my parents. So kind of, let's say, many different, uh, I'm a wife, a spouse, I'm a religious sister, whatever, it's kind of varied, but we have this particular state in life 
And if we don't take care of the duties that we have for our state in life, then it really doesn't make sense to try to go do something else, to try to do some other external apostolate helping other people. If I'm a father and, oh, I have to go to this rosary group and, you know, go preach and help all these, all these other people, but I'm not working and so therefore my family is falling into poverty and they don't have anything to eat, well, that's not good. I need to focus first on the duties of my state in life. Or if I'm a mother and I'm not being a good mother, if I'm a priest and I'm not being a good priest, if I am a student but I don't study, I'm a worker and I don't do my job well, etc., then something's wrong. That should be the first, let's say, first set of obligations that we have to look to. Why? Because that is the concrete way that God has given us for our salvation, for serving Him, for giving Him glory. It is our vocation, we could say. So we can't try to be leaven in the world and go help others if I'm neglecting my own, uh, the own basic necessities, the basic obligations of my life. So that is the first obligation that we have. More than these external apostolates or whatever, or other obligations, we have to tend to the obligations of our state in life. Second, this perfect fulfillment of the obligations of our state leads us to an authentic testimony of Christian life. So this testimony of Christian life can shine forth when we live the obligations of our state in life. So this testimony of Christian life is the second obligation, and this makes visible the living Christ. Again, if I'm, yeah, if, I, if I'm a Christian and I'm trying to convert others, and I'm a father and I'm neglecting my family and they're suffering, uh, what kind of example am I really giving of, of Christ? I'm not giving a good example, so it's not really a good testimony. So first, take care of ourselves, our, our duty and our, our state in life, I mean, and then also live, uh, I mean, that's part of it, but then live, you know, the testimony of Christian life. So there's this beautiful text from St. John Paul II um, from this document, Christi Fidelis Laici, on the mission and role of the lay faithful in the church, and it's quoted in our directory for third order. It says, the responsibility of the lay faithful in particular is to testify how the Christian faith constitutes the only fully valid response, consciously perceived and stated by all in varying degrees, to the problems and hopes that life poses to every person and society. This vital synthesis will be achieved when the lay faithful know how to put the gospel and their daily duties of life into a most shining and convincing testimony where not fear, but the loving pursuit of Christ and adherence to Him will be the factors determining how a person is to live and grow, and these will lead to new ways of living more in conformity with human dignity." So this, this beautiful idea of this vital synthesis between the gospel, what we profess, and then what we live. So not just we preach the faith, we say we believe this, but actually to live it. This produces the testimony that Christ is really the Savior and the fullness of man in all his aspects, and that's what will attract people when we have this synthesis. It's not some hypocritical, I believe in Christ, but I don't live it. The third obligation, tertiaries, or members of the third order, commit themselves to the apostolate of prayer, which is the first of the apostolates. So these other things we talked about as obligations, more as, let's say, duties, maybe not so much apostolates per se. This one here comes to apostolate, which is the apostolate of prayer. As the most important source of apostolic action, they must aim to be apostles with prayer, since it is the form of every apostolate. That is why the fraternities or movements that promote the genuine apostolate of prayer will always be encouraged as the first and principal means to continue the propagation of the gospel. Say, uh, that's what our directory says. And it continues, the directory says, quoting Christ, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Matthew chapter seven, verses seven through eight. It's interesting that the directory says, it is the first and principal means to continue the propagation of the gospel. It's not a means among others. It's the principal means. Because really what, what we do in, in evangelizing may be external. I'm teaching someone, I'm preaching, and that's great, and I do it for the good of their soul, and I'm, I'm praying and I'm hoping you know, that God will touch this person's soul and maybe help them to grow closer or to convert if they don't believe in Christ or who knows. But if we don't have prayer, it won't have as much efficacy 
maybe it does have some efficacy again because I'm sacrificing, I'm giving myself and God wants the good of that person. But when I pray, that's really the, let's say the key to opening the hearts because this external me talking to someone, me doing whatever, that's not what converts someone. What converts someone is them accepting the grace that God gives into their heart. And how does grace come? It doesn't just come by words. It comes by, by God. And God especially wants to give that through prayer. So prayer is so very important. Fourth, together with these previous commitments, there must always be a generous collaboration along with the religious members of the religious family. So with the priests, the brothers, the sisters. Um, so that is to say the, the third order members should collaborate and help the priests and the sisters, the brothers and their apostolates um, that they undertake for the evangelization of culture. So this family united, let's say. The fifth obligation we have is to seek the Christian renewal of the temporal order as lay people. So this kind of will bring up a series of various concrete things that we can do. But so it's in a sense, it's kind of a broad umbrella thing that covers many things. But what do we mean by the Christian renewal of the temporal order? We have to have the conviction that the gospel needs to transform the lives of men in a profound way, in a total way. So it's not just, do you believe in Christ? Great. We baptize you, you go to mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation, you're good. No, we need to really evangelize the, the whole man. We say in, in our directory that we want to transform or bring the gospel to every man, every person, the whole man, the whole of that person, and all of the manifestations of men. So every aspect of human society, not just, let's say, our religious beliefs or, yeah, our, our creed, but society, uh, our families, the political institutions we have, laws, the economic order, um, education, sports and entertainment, all of that every, and, and more, whatever else we can add, all these different aspects, manifestations of man or parts of his life, parts of culture, God wants to redeem all of that. We can't just say we only focus on the spiritual things of man and using only spiritual means. No, because we are a whole and God created everything and everything is supposed to be restored in Christ. In fact, we're fallen. We have a fallen nature. And so if we don't restore parts of our lives, if I give God my faith or my, my Sunday, but then I don't give him my family life, I don't allow him to transform my political involvement in whatever capacity, my voting or whatever, my education, the way, if I don't allow those other things to be transformed, then it's those elements of our temporal life, which are not directly spiritual, will become enemies of our sanctification and of the gospel, or they will become an idol that's something that will pull us away from God. So the whole of the temporal order has to be transformed by the gospel. And in fact, when Christ became a man, he didn't just, as we said before, I believe, he didn't just become a human being. He became a human being, a man, in a certain time, in a certain place, speaking a certain language, in a family, he had a job, etc. So he, God, made man, became, um, or he renewed all of these aspects of life, and when we prolong the incarnation, we have to do the same. Of course, we do have to respect the different uh, ambits, the different, let's say, realms, the temporal profane, in a, not in a bad sense, but the profane level, and then the spiritual. We don't, you know, we don't have to go, I don't know, we don't have to go sprinkling with holy water everything in the entire world. Um, but we still need to, even the things that are profane, that are not spiritual in themselves, should be illuminated by the principles of the gospel um, and the power and grace of Christ. So that everything that we do in some way or another is moved by the Spirit of God. And this is proper to the laity because the laity are in this temporal order. They live in the profane as we, you know, in a bad way, not profane as in bad, but uh, the things of the world, they live in the earthly society more than the religious do. Of course we do to some extent, obviously we, we still live on earth and stuff, but the religious or the, the lay people are involved in these sectors of society's ambits or manifestations of culture more than we are. And so it's more proper to them to sanctify these particular realms. The sixth obligation of members of the Third Order is the proclamation of the Word of God in all its forms. Obviously, a layperson can't preach a homily because that's reserved to the ordained clergy, but 
we need to know that since we are baptized in Christ, all of us, we participate in the prophetic role of Christ, his prophetic office, um, the munus propheticum. So Christ is a priest, prophet, and king. And we, by our baptism, are priests. We share in the priesthood of Christ, the common priesthood of the faithful. We are kings because we are heirs with Christ in the kingdom of heaven. And we are called to reign with him spiritually. And we're also prophets because when he was, his prophetic mission is him coming and preaching the good news, teaching people and, and leading them to the truth. We too, according to our capacity as a priest maybe, or as a religious, in this case as lay people, can participate, have to participate in that according to our own way. Um, and yes, we could say, okay, well, we, we have to live, you know, the testimony of, of Christian life, as we said, there should be this harmony between what we believe and how we live, and that's good. We have to give a good example, but we also need to take concrete actions to externally uh, spread the gospel to Christ, not just, oh, wow, that's a good example. I want to imitate that. Yes, that's super important, but also directly sometimes in different contexts, talking to people about it. So there are different ways that we can do this, such as in conversations with friends, giving good advice, helping maybe by teaching catechesis, catechism, giving classes, using social media, doing, not every single person has to do every single thing, of course, but there, we have to see what am I capable of doing? How can I share the gospel of Christ um, in an effective way in my life? And I think something important with this proclaiming the gospel, yes, we have to see based on our own abilities, our own state in life, our own situation, our own temperament even, what we are able to do or, or what would be effective for us. And it doesn't mean that everyone has to knock on doors and say, hi, my name is Jacob. Do you believe in Christ? Would you like to become Catholic? Like that may not be the most effective way. <laughs> Maybe in certain, it could be. Sometimes we do and missions go knock on doors and invite people to the church. That's fine. But it doesn't mean that you have to, okay, I have to preach to everyone I see and, and the most, you know, it has, but we can't also be too shy. Like, oh, I don't preach. I just, I give a good witness in my life. Yeah, but maybe in a way we should also talk to people. You know, we can bring stuff up. Even in respecting, of course, our, like respecting, as we said, the different realms. If I'm a psychologist or I'm a doctor or a teacher, we have to do our job, be a, a doctor, a teacher, teach the subject we're supposed to teach. But in a way we can also use that when appropriate to spread uh, the good news of Christ, especially, you know, as a therapist or, or, yeah, a teacher. Maybe you're not teaching spiritual stuff, you're teaching math. But there are ways, especially if you know the students well or who knows what, you can, in some way that's appropriate and effective, you can even insert, not as something secret, but insert the good news of Christ. Finally, we talk about the, as another obligation, the service of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So there are many also many parts of this, we could say, by which the laity can help spread the kingdom of truth, justice, and charity that Christ came to bring on earth, the kingdom of God. And we could talk about the service to the poor, the most needy. One particular aspect of this that is really merits our attention is special emphasis on the apostolate with families and in families. The family has been called the domestic church. At least that's what it's called to be. It's supposed to be a domestic church. It's the nucleus of society, the, the basic you know, cell of society. So from our families, our society comes forth. You know, our, our, even on the psychological level, what we receive in our family will affect us and help us or hurt us later on in life. And in a spiritual level, what children learn from early on, it stays with them more easily than if they learn it as an adult and, and never knew about it. So we should, in our own families, and also in the families of others, and in so far as we're able to help them, um, try to bring Christ. We should try to help families to, you know, among the spouses, but also in raising the children, uh, have that spirit of the gospel, even in the family. So everything that touches the family, that can help the family, both materially or temporally, and also spiritually, of course, is something that we, as members of the Third Order, should take as a priority apostolate. Because we've talked, uh, or maybe we've heard about inflection points of culture. If we want to evangelize the culture, we need to go to where, let's say, the culture 
is based or where the turning points that move culture, education, the mass media, and a big one is the family, among others. So if, if we don't, let's say, touch the family, if we don't move the family or help the family, then we're really neglecting a serious part of culture and the formation of culture. And of course, the, the well-being of, of people. So if the, if the family is what it's supposed to be, if it is this great domestic church, if it's like a spiritual womb, nourishing children in the gospel and in charity, in justice, in honesty, in responsibility, etc., in the virtues, in faith, in the Christian life. And then, of course, also important secular values or virtues like education and, and things like that, which are also good. So if, the, if the, it's this womb, let's say, that's nurturing these, these children, then it's able to send them forth into life when they become adults, as mature spiritually and, and other ways, mature adults who can not only have good families themselves, but also spread the gospel more effectively to others. So they themselves will be well-formed, which will be a benefit for themselves, but it will also benefit society at large, both in a temporal way and more importantly, in a spiritual way, in a supernatural way. So now we move on to the third part of this four-part catechesis, which is about the benefits of belonging to the third order of the religious family of the Incarnate Word. So everything that belongs to the congregation, spiritually speaking, is also mine in a sense. I am now part of this body, so the good of this body is now also my good. And so the spiritual goods, all the merits, the prayers, the sacrifices, the apostolates, the missions of our male and female religious, as well as of our other third order members, the lay members, that becomes this spiritual wealth, this spiritual treasure, also becomes a spiritual treasure that's mine as well. I give myself to that body and I put my little grain of sand and then now I'm part of this whole, this whole group. So there's spiritual benefits that we, let's say, won't maybe see. Maybe we can see benefits in our, in our life like, at a spiritual level, certain growth and, and certain things. But maybe it's more of a hidden nature because sometimes, I mean, we can't see grace. We can see its effects sometimes. Um, so there's this supernatural, let's say, benefit that, yeah, may not be as visible. But then there's also a more visible uh, external benefits, such as now that we're a part of this third order, we are educated and formed in the faith and the specific spirituality of this religious family by other members, especially by the priests and the religious. So we're able to participate in that formation in the family spirit. We're able to participate in different liturgies, different events that we have throughout, uh, throughout the year, different missions and apostolates that now we can um, participate in more fully. So there's this yeah, visible, let's say, fruits or benefits as well as spiritual benefits. At the most basic level, which we call the third order, or the, th sorry, the third degree of the third order, is the desire to belong as a layperson to the religious family by, fact, by the fact of being a benefactor, a friend, a relative, being included in a certain parish that's under the charge of the priest of the IVE, for instance, being in a school under the charge of the priests or the sisters or involved in some work of mercy or somehow having contact with our order. So it's having some sort of contact with our religious family and wanting to participate in that, um, wanting to live that spirituality and integrate ourselves into that, that third order. But this is a very, yeah, a basic level. Then there is the middle degree, the second degree, which is certain associations or like groupings of people, of the faithful, and they have in a sense their own sort of autonomy, but they are still part under this like brotherhood of the third order. So they're still members of the third order, but they're a particular group that has a particular function and also other extra obligations because of their specific identity or an autom autonomy in the third order, but still this lay faithful association group within it. And then there is the first degree of the third order. And so basically they are already members of the third degree. They're already a lay person who is involved and they want to participate in this spirituality. But then they want to bind themselves further by making some sort of consecration, either by a private vow or some other form of sacred bond. I know of a few people who have done this. They make a vow of chastity. Uh, they, you don't become a religious, a 
consecrated religious. You do become consecrated in a way, but not as a religious. You would stay, you would still be a, a lay person, a lay member, but then you are consecrated in with this vow or other sacred bond and a member of the first degree, let's say. And this is like an external, or it is an external gradation where we can kind of delineate easily the different levels of participation. And that's important, but it also, that really depends on what God is calling us to. It doesn't mean that I'm not holier, or that I'm not as holy as someone else, just because, oh, they did the first degree and I'm only in the third degree. I didn't take a vow. Maybe God's not calling you to take a vow. You're a married man, so God's not calling you to take a vow of celibacy like he is some other person. So we have this external gradation or external levels of participation in the third order, but then there's also this internal or interior participation in the third order, which depends more on how much we want to participate in the third order. Um, our, it depends more on our freedom with the help of grace. Not so much God has called me to this particular, particular level, okay, I will take a vow or I will be the third degree or whatever, but it's more how fully I give myself to my life as a member of the third order, how much I participate, how much I, uh, how devout I am in that. And so here is where we see the, this principle that the more I give of myself, the more I will receive. So it doesn't necessarily matter so much that, oh, I'm only in the third degree, or I don't know, that's not a, yeah, that shouldn't be something someone should say. It's more, you know, I'm in the third degree, or I'm in whatever degree, but how much am I really trying to participate in the spirituality of the religious family? How much am I making use of the means of sanctification that this particular spirituality and charism gives me. Um, if, if we make heavy use of that, if we do the spiritual exercises every year as we recommend, as if I do spiritual direction frequently, I really try to pray the rosary every day, do these different things that we highly recommend, um, and I further my formation by reading great books and stuff along those lines, then I will benefit more. I'll benefit more and, and I will be sanctified more. I will have more spiritual goods coming to my soul. Great. The more I unite myself to the spirit and charism of the religious family. Finally, our directory speaks about the structure and government of the third order. So at the top, the, let's say the head of the third order, the, the superior, is the general superior of the Institute of the Incarnate Word. So the priest in charge of all of the Institute of the Incarnate Word is also the priest who governs and is the head of the Third Order. He also can have a senior advisor for the Third Order. The senior advisor doesn't have a governing function, but he helps. Um, he assists the, the General Superior in, in looking out for the welfare of the Third Order members. So the, the General Superior is over the entire Third Order. And then in the Institute of the Incarnate Word, we have different provinces so the head of each province, the provincial superior, who is under the general superior, that priest will be in charge of um, seeking the welfare, prolonging um, yeah, the good and seeking the formation, etc., of the third order members in his province. So you have the general superior over everyone, the provincial superior over those in his province, and then there can be individuals also entrusted with formation of the third order members, like in a specific parish or an area or whatever. We hope that these catechesis videos are helpful to you for, for those of you who are interested in learning more about the Institute of the Incarnate Word, the Religious Family, and also specifically the Third Order, and especially for those of you who are wanting, planning to enter soon into the Third Order, into this, to be part of this gift, this charism and spirituality that the Holy Spirit has inspired in the Church. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. Our Lady of Luhan, pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we want to change the culture, if we want to influence society, then we should try to influence, for the better, those particular areas. If we, if we want to change a society, we have to change.